Hello and a very warm welcome to the Rethinking Cyber podcast with me, Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. In this second series of in-depth and insightful conversations, we sit down with thought leaders and global industry experts as we continue to raise awareness of the challenges and the opportunities surrounding cyberspace. Today's podcast guest is Professor William H. Dutton, who spoke to me on the ground at the Global Cybersecurity Forum in Riyadh this year. An eminent academic, he is a Martin Fellow supporting the work of Oxford University's Global Cybersecurity Capacity Centre in the Department of Computer Science. He is the university's first professor of Internet Studies and the founding director of the Oxford Internet Institute. Professor Dutton has published many books and his latest release is The Fifth Estate, The Power Shift of the Digital Age. Professor, it's great to see you. Thank you for talking to me today. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Let me start by asking you about GCF. Um, Welcome to Saudi, your first time here, and welcome to your first Global Cybersecurity Forum. Thank you. You've been speaking to our delegates about closing the talent gap and cybersecurity capacity building. Explain to us what is capacity building in the context of cybersecurity? It's a concept that, in a sense, was born with the Internet, because I, in the early days of computing in organizations, cybersecurity, well, security, compu- they used to call it computer security. Uh, computer security was... Uh, basically handled by a computing staff, ec- experts that in, in an office that would basically ring fence the organization and make sure that uh, n- corporate use of the computer was, was safe. But with the internet, the boundaries of the office and the external world have been changed forever. So we have, instead of everyone coming to the office to log on to their computer or coming in on a, on a on a telephone line with security clearance, the um, we have now 5.3 billion internet users worldwide uh, at every level of the organization, from the top executives to the customers and citizens and so forth. So now that the, the internet makes uh, the protection of security by IT experts in an institution or in a nation or in a household, impossible to be totally effective. I mean, obviously, there is a role for IT and cybersecurity expertise. Cyber is, is a sort of a concept about the early concept of, of the virtual space of the internet when you have a conversation online while you're in cyberspace or the idea that there'll be a cyber communities of people tied together online rather than in physical space. So the concept of cyber stuck it's even a dated concept, even though it, but it's stuck with cybersecurity because we're talking about security in, a, in the digital age when, uh, when we don't have any kind of ability to co- completely ring fence any kind of any physical geographical space. Now that means that capacity building, how do you do that? And it, you can't protect security. So what you can do is you can try to create this, a situation where you you don't collapse if there is a problem, that you're resilient, um, say as an individual, if you lost your computer or you broke your computer, that would be a, a problem for you. You'd be as if you had been attacked or your t- computer had been disabled. Well, then, well, you might have a, 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 a copy of the contents of your computer on a storage drive, or you could have it in the cloud so you can restore your operations immediately, uh, get a new computer, upload the, you know, and you're off running. So you're resilient, even though you can't prevent yourself from losing your computer or dropping it or having a problem. So think of that in an organization or a nation, and, and you can think about, well, if we had a blackout or if, if there was a denial of service attack or anything else, how could we uh, recover from that, and so when then we think of uh, what needs to be thought through in the, in that regard, and and it's far more than the technology or the 
the uh, the experts to deal with the technology. In fact, we we have a model. We have what we call a cybersecurity maturity model, and we go to different nations and uh, uh, use this model to to rate the maturity of their cybersecurity. But that's it covers everything from technological standards and uh, uh, to uh, culture and society and uh, people's uh, psycho you know awareness of, of cybersecurity to policy and uh, education and learning and so forth. It sounds like a, a mammoth task assessing countries with varying levels of technological development and resources looking to enhance their cybersecurity capabilities and build a more secure global cyberspace. So how does it work in practice? Uh, it sounds impossible, doesn't it? But uh, but it actually, it's quite doable. And there's a process by which we are able to do that. First of all, we developed this model based upon talking to uh, cybersecurity experts uh, uh, globally and in different disciplines. Cybersecurity, it's no longer just a computer science topic. It's actually dealing with psychology and politics and policy and sociology and uh, you name it. Every every discipline is is uh, is is uh, on the board in terms of d figuring out how to how to protect a, a country in in this in cyberspace. So we brought those experts together about what what kinds of things should we look for, and that led to us having these five areas of maturity. And 800 different indicators, and then at the, so we go to we go to countries. We send two to three different researchers there, and they spend a week to two weeks there uh, uh, doing focus groups, up to at least 10 focus groups, uh, with uh, groups talking about two of the maturity areas, and uh, each of the each each focus group deals with two areas, and we mix them, match them, and over 10 and we record those and and then we interview people as well we do all the homework before we go in terms of uh looking at every document that we can uh, uh official government documents and other other reviews that we then draft a report for the country people in the country then review that report and uh, we go back and forth with that and uh once they agree to it, then we publish the report if they wish, because the country would own the report. So that uh, if we did a, a cybersecurity capacity review for Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabia would own that report and they could publish it or they could decide not to publish it. Only two countries out of 130 where we've done reviews have, have decided not they don't want to publish it. Can but, you tell uh, us why? There are very idiosyncratic reasons, like there is a change of uh, government or uh, whatever, and they they didn't new government hadn't contracted to do this, and so they probably didn't want to give credit. But <laughs> but there are various. But you might think that people would uh, would not want to publish it because they didn't do well, they didn't score well. And I'm, I'm just really quite surprised, pleasantly surprised that that's not at all the case. In fact, the most common response we have is if if a country's rated low on something like education and learning, on, on knowledge development, they don't have enough training uh, training programs. They're not doing enough to raise public awareness, for example. They will say to us themselves that thank you. I mean that that really helps us make this case because we we agree with you. So it helps target investment in cybersecurity. But we don't rate the countries. We don't we try to rate where how mature they are in each area and they and with the obvious no-brainer that they could be more mature in some areas. So they know where they lack maturity and what they need to do. We can actually tell them what they need to do to get to the next stage of maturity. Out of all that data collated and shared um, publicly or not, um, what have been some of the most surprising findings from your side? Well, it's surprising how many countries are at very low levels of maturity, uh, and uh, and also that uh, the degree to which it's it's bound up with uh, uh, economic development to a degree. So, uh, countries that are at higher stages of economic development are better able to, for example, develop educational programs and universities and and training programs and so forth. So, in fact, uh, and the uh, the flip side of that is is one of the most common things that uh, countries do with their if they're low in maturity in many things, they're often 
mature on law. <laughs> so it's cheap to pass a law, but it doesn't necessarily have, make anything happen. So that's why you have to look at the whole range of, of issues that, that support cybersecurity capacity. Do we have any idea if these reports, these findings, propel investment into the sector, into the protection of nations, the, the cybersecurity of countries, their infrastructure, their people? Well, we don't know, but I think everybody feels like they're in a boat encircled by crocodiles. But you really focus on the crocodile nearest the boat. And generally, cybersecurity is not the crocodile nearest the boat. And so sometimes uh, it's underfunded relative to other things that are more immediate and catastrophic, potentially. And, and, and because many of the, so many people say, use a mobile smartphone, which, are, which has pretty good security. Uh, even work from home on a mobile smartphone or go to school. On the, so uh, many laptops and uh, equipment and networks and platforms provide fairly global, pretty good cybersecurity. So it's, it's people who um, are unable to follow good practice, say, uh, by, uh, using pirated software that can't be updated and um, uh, not using up-to-date software for other reasons, what have you, that uh, often are the most vulnerable, for example. When it comes to the key skills and knowledge areas that individuals and companies, organizations need to focus on to really effectively enhance their capacity in cyberspace, what would they be? I think, first of all, to develop a, a cybersecurity mindset. And I think that, that understand that um, computing is an experience technology. So um, you can't just explain uh, the internet to somebody or, or cybersecurity to somebody, they'll probably be more confused than before. You need to use it. Um, there are two groups of people who are the most fearful of the internet. One are people who've never used it. And so if, you, if people who've never used the internet or never used social media are the most distrustful of social media or the internet, okay? The other group are the people who are experts. <laughs> they know too much. Yes. They know everything that could possibly go wrong. So they, they you know, I, have, I know many of these people, but they're, they're too small of a group to even show up on a survey. They don't show up. But they're at the high end, and they're probably some of the people raising the alarms over AI are, uh, know so much about the, what, all the possible things that could go wrong that they just... Well, this might happen, or this might happen. So they often, you'll find that the the top experts don't even use the technology. They're they're they don't use social media. Oh no, I'm not going to put my name online and so forth. I think it's the wrong lesson. I don't. I think the people who use the internet realize what it can do for them and the opportunities it provides. They also experience problems, but they it doesn't. People who've experienced problems are uh, are less trusting than others, but but they have a learned level of trust, which is good. Uh, having blind faith in technology or having no trust in technology is bad. And so I think some of the experts are 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 just lack experience in using some of the technologies they've helped create. I think. We've briefly touched upon sociology and uh, you have a special uh, research interest in the internet and society having published on the topic. Um, can we get your view on where you believe cyberspace will be going in the next 10 years and its potential impact on society? Well, uh, I just published a book called The Fifth Estate and it's uh, the subtitle is The Power Shift of the Digital Age. And I think that captures uh, what I think is the major social impact of the of computing, telecommunications, the internet, social media, all, and, and will be the impact of AI as well, which is uh, through the use of specific functionalities of the internet and social media, pe individuals, ordinary people, not, not computer experts, or ordinary people can search uh, for information with tools that are the same as, as researchers or academics might use. They can also um, organize their own social networks. They can decide who they will network with socially, and they're not limited by uh, their where they live or where they work. 
Uh, they can talk to people with their interests anywhere in the world. And likewise, on certs, they're not limited to going to their university or going to their local library. They go anywhere in the world that the information they need is. Uh, they can aggregate the comments of others. They can look at how their, their friends rate something, a product or something. Um, they can get services. They don't have to go to their local store. They can go online if they if they can't find what they are looking for and locally. So they can uh, go to an online shopping service securely and actually pay for it without losing their money. <laughs> get it get it the next day. So this is together. They I'm, and they can also you know people who who feel that their company or their government is is actually misusing or uh, violating the law or principles. They can leak online like Edward Snowden did about uh, uh, surveillance of, of the public. And, um, and through all those mechanisms, individuals are enhancing their informational and communicative power. So they are relatively more powerful than they would be if they did not have access to these technologies. They're not more, more powerful than institutions. Institutions, uh, government, uh, uh, educational institutions, they have the press, they have access to all these tools as well. But if the networked individuals uh, did not have access to these, they would be much less, uh, they would be dependent upon these. And now they're more independent, more able to form their own opinions and, and um, uh, hold other institutions accountable. Now, networked individuals can say, no, uh, I'm sorry, the press got this wrong. I was there. I saw what happened, and this is not the way it happened. And uh, more and more, the press is uh, basing their news on on social media accounts. Lastly, let me ask you about your standout moment from GCF 2023. What's your key takeaway? Um, well, I think it was a, a very successful event. From as more the more I understand uh, the government's focus on education and uh, bringing the country along in terms of uh, uh, diversity and uh, building more talent in the country and, and internationalizing and so forth. It's been a tremendous success. I learned a lot from listening to the talks and had great conversations with people. I've never seen a conference exactly like this. Um, and so I uh, applaud the organizers. I think it was a, a an innovative approach to a conference, and I'm really happy to be one of the international speakers, but <laughs> contributed a bit to the discussion. And you have contributed much to our podcast, so thank you very much for being with us today and taking the time. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And so it just remains for me to also thank you, our listeners, and to encourage you to download more episodes in the Rethinking Cyber podcast series from Spotify and Apple. We look forward to welcoming you next time on the ground at GCF 2024 in Riyadh. Until then, take care and goodbye.